All right, so welcome to another episode of Holding the Wall. Today we have with us we have the great, famous Chris Miller, extraordinaire. Uh, thank you for joining us today. It is my pl- no, it's yours. It's your pleasure. Yeah, I, th- I think I'd agree with that. It is probably our <laughs> pleasure. You've honored us as being our first guest on the podcast, so thank you for that. I'm excited about it. And I want to thank you for the gift. Yeah, absolutely. So today we're going to talk about pretty much what your specialty is, and that's going to be healthcare education. <laughs> so I guess we should mention how we yeah. met Mr. Miller. Seven years ago, about. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Miller was our uh, one of our instructors for skills in paramedic that's a school. Whole another decade. Uh, I don't want this to turn into too much of a circle jerk, but I want to <laughs> say that you are like a huge. You can pull your pants up. <laughs> <laughs> A really big mentor for my life. That's why I wanted you to be one of our first guests. Well, thank you. Um, my entire career, as far as the fire service is concerned, has always had you as like the backbone, you know, going through school. You know, you were always that instructor for me who I looked up to and I was like trying to impress like I during like fooled, every skill. <laughs> like if I didn't live up to my full potential during a skill or something and I saw that little bit of disappointment, I'd be like beating myself up womp, about it. And womp, it was womp. so ridiculous. But um, <laughs> I don't know. I appreciate all the mentorship over the years and can definitely say that you might be one of the main reasons I got hired in the fire service with all of the um, letters of recommendation and all the stuff that you've helped me with. So well, thank years. you. So thank, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank all you. Right. I'm here all week, folks. Now you can find your pants. Uh, Tip right. your waitress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, my, uh, my memories of medic school was always mega code. Uh, I mean, that was, I think daunting for us when we oh, first did God. it. And then, you know, Towards the end, when we actually had the skills down, and then we did the jungle code and stuff, and it really became fun. And then that even worked on delegation and yeah, that, that's so. one of my my most prevalent memories is, are the mega codes and okay. having Mr. Miller sit there with his pen, holding just, it I, like I, I this just... as he analyzed what you're doing, and you're just like, God, I hope this is going well. <laughs> was I doing the um, Was I doing the the handicap thing with with you guys by the time you got to me where everybody the, had a handicap yeah yeah, yeah. yes that That's, was like our little jungle code mm-hmm. yeah that, i've carried that in the medical school and yeah. I, I do that with my emergency medicine uh, residents uh when nice. they think that they got it all and they're like a third year resident and they're all cocky and crap and i i suit them up so everybody has a handicap <laughs> so how that works uh i have a, a little it's an old medical bag and I've got a pair of uh, goggles, safety goggles that are in there that I've sanded. So you can't, you can see shapes, but you can't see any definition. I've got a pair of gardening gloves. Uh, I've got some earplugs and ear protectors and uh, duct tape and a sling. So everybody in, in the five-person team ends up with a handicap. Either you can't see or you can't hear, you can't talk, you can't use your dominant arm. And um, then you run a code. Let's see how good you are. And it's always, uh, first time around, it's always, well, we can't do this. There's no way this is going to work. This is just <laughs> stupid. I say, yeah, whatever. Clock's on. And um, I was notorious for, for running a, a sound effect of a clock ticking. The infamous time is tissue. And um, some students, it would really bother them. Most of them, it didn't. But there's a couple. They'd hear that thing going tick, 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 tick. The, the whole point of, of the exercise wasn't to befuddle them as much as it was to learn how to communicate through adversity and also how to quickly identify your team's strengths and weaknesses. So the second time you did the code, you had it figured out. And by the third time, everybody was on a skill that they could do regardless of their handicap because we played to their strength. I brought the same thing to the School of Medicine. It's a lot of fun. You know, they see all that stuff and at first they're kind of hemming and hawing about it. But (laughs) um, what I've learned since I've been teaching medical students is that they're no different than paramedic students yeah they all have desires they all have um, uh, their own insecurities and I identify those as quickly as I can so I can make them more gooder <laughs> well, more gooder yeah well I'd, I'd like to say that you know I just met Mr. Miller like what 10 minutes ago and you are my biggest Mentos <laughs> <laughs> I like Mentos <laughs> it, it makes the, the breath the fresh maker. <laughs> yeah, so and, and when you were saying you know jungle code I'm like, like Shit, this dude's having Flashbacks from Vietnam, man. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You, you were a medic in Vietnam? Wow, that's <laughs> far out, man. What kind of jungle? And then, by the way, about two minutes ago, uh, I just thought your place was haunted, but then I realized it was a siren in the background. Yeah, yeah. yeah. nice, nice. So, yeah, I, re- I really appreciate the kind of ingenuity that you brought to teaching. And we definitely were recognizing it. Ryan and I were talking about it last week. And we definitely see it with what you're doing at UCR now. Like, if you want to talk a little bit about that, but we saw that you're doing. Um, simulations from kind of start to finish with the paramedics the nurses the doctors and just kind of 
doing this big elaborate simulation. So I thought that was just a really, um, yeah, it came out really well. I was, I was surprised, you know, the, the way that, that, um, I, I went into the fire service in 1971 when I joined the air force and the, the way that firefighters were trained is, uh, maybe 20%, 30% in the classroom. The rest of the time you're out on the tarmac, you're dragging hose and throwing ladders and you're, you're applying what you've learned. So, that's pretty much been my career. The only time I had any stumbling block was when I was in medic school because you had nurses that wanted to be the, the talking head and they had no idea what it was like to be a paramedic because they were all nurses and they would stand there and talk 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 and you couldn't <laughs> wait to get that part of, of your education over with so you could at least be rounding and doing clinical stuff and then you found out what it was really like when you became a paramedic and you were doing your rookie stuff. But... Um, I've brought that into the School of Medicine and initially met with a lot of resistance because medical school is about 500 years of tradition unimpinged by progress, a lot like the fire service. Things just don't change. And I still have uh, physicians who want to do all the talking because they have a lecture they've created over the last 30 years. And I had one guy even tell me that this is my baby. <laughs> it's like it's my child. I can't not to do this. I need to demonstrate how knowledgeable I really am. Yeah. Yeah, it's very frustrating. Um, so one of the things you were talking about, the um, interprofessional education, uh, that's a big thing that I brought in the medical school. I've, um, I've presented across the nation about it that I, I don't have doctors teaching student medical students. I have people that do the do teaching them. So instead of having uh, trying to find all these physicians who know how to suture, I find the PAs that are suturing and the MPs that are suturing, and those are the people that, that teach. Mm -hmm. And for my higher-end students, um, as they grow, um, everything's a progression. So you lay that foundation of basic knowledge, just like anything we do. Mm -hmm. And once you get that foundation down, then you start to build on that. So um, they see the PAs and the NPs for the first year and second year. Third year, fourth year, they're seeing uh, uh, OB-GYNs and uh, plastic surgeons, people that are really in there doing it. And if they want to continue on and go into emergency medicine or trauma surgery or something where they'll be throwing a lot of thread, then I hook them with those people. But if it's somebody that's going after uh, one of the more primary care things like internal medicine, family medicine, or even psychiatry, then they really don't have to have that depth of knowledge. Yeah. Um, but I have, um, that was the big thing for me, was having nurses teach. Initially, a lot of pushback. Man, a lot of pushback. And I was so fortunate that my boss at the time, Paul Lyons, he, um, he was the 500-pound gorilla who'd stand behind me. So as soon as I'd, I'd say somebody, they'd start to go, wait a minute. Uh, he'd just stand there and give them the stink eye, <laughs> and they'd back down until um, finally I was presenting naturally and I, nationally, and I had my own horsepower. Yeah. Uh, and then once it went, it went. So I'm pretty excited about uh, I was going to retire last November. That was my plan. I was in, in, in and out for five years because I'm, I'm already retired a few times from uh, LA City Fire and Hemet Fire and also from the California Community College District. And I didn't know if I wanted to teach in a school of medicine because I didn't, you know, most, a lot of the doctors I knew at the time were like doctors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say asshole, um, but like <laughs> doctor. And uh, you can beep that, I guess, if you want. But um, uh, I said circle jerk earlier, so I think well, that's Yeah, that's a good point. Good point. Yeah, I'll take that to heart. Uh, what I found was um, that was it was another family. It was uh, a lot of people with the same uh, same mores and character integrity that I have that I look for. And uh, the ones that didn't have that um, kind of fell by the wayside. I've been at um, UC Riverside School of Medicine since 2013. And um, the people that were my real nemesis are all gone now. Uh, the younger physicians who wanted to get on board with the way that I teach, which is uh, anything that's engaging and innovative and uh, the students teaching students, uh, that kind of stuff. I kept telling them to just wait. We'll outlive them, even though most of them were my age. I said, it's all right, man. We'll <laughs> and uh, we have. So it's neat nice. to see that come back. Yeah, I think when you find a team that's hungry and eager to make progress, mm -hmm. you know, you, you definitely find those people who have the pushback. You know, it's it's a war of attrition. You're going to outlast those people because you are the that hungry individual and when you push past them. You know, that's when real change and progress gets made. So, Yeah, and I certainly cater to the students. It's the students. It's their education. If they want to design it and make it different, then let them design it and make it different. 
Yeah. Uh, that's why we brought in uh, ultrasound. Nobody in the building wanted uh, point of care ultrasound, but the students wanted it. I didn't even know what it was, but they knew that I had a sympathetic ear. So mm -hmm. um, all I had to do was see it used once. I saw it at uh, in the emergency room at Cedars, and I, pff, I drank the Kool Aid big time. Yeah, I've read a, or listened to a couple of podcasts where they talk about that. It's be over my head, but like I know how it's utilized and mm -hmm. how like beneficial it can be. Oh, it's, it won't be for long. Yeah. Because it's already in pre-hospital on the East Coast. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. See, I think that's another important thing that you're doing with uh, combining all the different professions is that they get to understand their scope of practice more, mm -hmm. you know, and that, yeah. that totally helps people understand what their capabilities are and what kind of care they can actually give. And then there, there's, there's some checks and balances with that, too. If you yeah, have a, yeah. a crappy EMS crew that didn't do anything for a patient that had potential right. procedures to be done, then the doctor can talk to, about, talk to them about that. Yeah, that's one of the things that, that um, the interprofessional education program that I put together is called SoCal Heal. It's the Southern California Healthcare Educators Alliance. And it's, um, it's us, and it's the nursing school at RCC, and it's the paramedic program at Marina Valley College, the PA program at Cal Baptist, the nurse practitioner program at, um, no, it's not the nurse practitioner program, it's the Zero to Hero Master's degree for, they have for um, mm. entry-level nurses at uh, Azusa Pacific. Okay. If you've never done any nursing, and but you've got a bachelor's already, yeah. this is oh, how wow. you get in. Um, and we've got uh, the pharmacy school at the Keck uh, Graduate Institute. So for the first two years of their education, uh, we bring them together, uh, 350 students, and uh, we put them on in a, a multivocational or intervocational team. So there's 10 people in the team, and each team, uh, and 35 teams, uh, they get a slowly evolving case. But what they learn is what their job is. Because a lot of them, first time through, they do define their own job. We look at their, at their oath uh, and all of that. Very simple case. But um, you find out real quickly that a lot of these people sitting at the table, whether they're paramedics or they're uh, medical school students, don't really know what they're getting into that they, they saw it on TV mm -hmm. uh, or they heard from a friend or I got an uncle uh, or I got a, uh, uh, my cousin, something like that. So they don't have I any idea what their scope is. Yeah. Uh, so we bring them together and uh, God, we have a good time. And each one of the, we will bring them together four times over two years. And uh, the very last case that they get is actually a tabletop uh, multi-casualty incident. So it's just second year. The physicians think they're starting to figure it all out. Right. The nurses are starting to get a little cocky. And here's the one that the paramedics hold the key. So it's really nice to bring them back to everybody is a part of this team. And everybody sees the, the patient with a different perspective. And everybody's perspective is valuable. No, that's great. I mean, I was telling Josiah a few weeks ago that now going through nursing school, definitely you don't key in on what other your other interprofessional providers do right, like right? right so i mean i've been there as a paramedic especially a new cocky paramedic you're like <laughs> you know dumb nurse like why would you question me on this and that and then <laughs> yeah now i'm here i'm like okay they weren't taught that or this and you know so i think it's really good that you're you're getting everybody involved at least they know what the other person's doing and it kind of you know like you said foundation solidifies that team yeah and, yeah we started it really big like that it just made sense to me um for some reason i probably was drinking too much that day but um <laughs> now i'm trying to take that and make it small and the hard part about making it small is that um students students and programs are bound by hours and they can only have so many hours of instruction mm. so it's difficult to add any more hours so uh, like for for simulation for instance with the school of medicine there is very little maybe one percent of their education over four years is cur in curriculum bound simulation. So I see very few of the students in curriculum stuff, but I see 100% of the students across all four years in extracurricular activities. The stuff that I've built that's fun um, because wouldn't want to teach something I wouldn't want to do. Uh, and I'm all about fun and about having a good time. And uh, I got mentored for about a year by the, the Dean of the School of Medicine at Stanford. And he actually, on the, their, their webpage, at the bottom of their webpage, he, he had a little statement where he believes the medical school could be fun. Doesn't mean it won't be difficult, but we will find ways to make it engaging. We will find ways to make it intriguing and interesting and a way to catch you and hook you. So I really believe what he said and uh, was able to do it with all this extracurricular stuff. So I didn't have to add any, any hours. Um, they just, you know, if you build it, they, they will come. And they did. They did. Nice. Yeah, I'm not going to compare paramedic but, school to, to no. medical school, but <laughs> no. uh, I definitely think the instructors at RCC definitely made it a, a fun experience, like it, retrospectively looking at it. 
maybe that's the big part of it yeah. is but yeah. it was a it was a good time i think yeah. the, our class made it fun and then that simulab or the sim lab that we built during our our class yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, the uh-huh. ambulance simulator the, the the room the the alley all that stuff you know that really brought together some of those simulators and patient assessments that we'd run you know, I, I thought that helped a ton yeah. do we have uh, uh in the school of medicine we had we had an emergency medicine interest group, and now it's got a, a whole different name because of the way that we've set it up. It's it's called LEAM. Uh, it's L-E-M-E. It's the Longitudinal Emergency Medicine Experience. So anybody that goes through it becomes a lemur, and they get a, <laughs> they get a T-shirt that has an angry-looking lemur on it, and he's got a little stethoscope. But it caught on, so we now have um, nursing students who are a part of that. And that's how I took this big IPE and made it small, by appealing to the smaller groups that know that this is the direction they want to go. Uh, and one of the first things that we do is take them to Clark. Oh, nice. uh, we take them all out of, their, out of the, the water that they're used to swimming in, mm-hmm. and we drop them into a lake. So there aren't, um, there aren't any lanes. There's no floaties. This is, this is all freestyle, baby. And uh, gosh, we have a good time. It's just fun. Because nice. they, they don't know what to do, and they're still scared of each other, which is kind of fun. Yeah, I, I ran a I, – actually, I think it was through your program where you're putting the med students and physician yeah, yeah. residents uh, through our department. Yeah. And uh, we had one of them who was working at a hospital in our area, but we had a pediatric full arrest, drowning. And it was uh, – you know, nobody ever wants to run those calls, but it was a really cool experience to see – have him see what we do. Exactly. And how we exactly. run it. He left uh, – he ended up telling his uh, his senior doctor or whoever was in charge of the uh, rideouts that – he thought it was a completely invaluable experience that he was able to see what we did and how organized and how everything was run. He was just blown away by how yeah, dealing yeah. with the stress of the call, having you know parents screaming at you, PD there, all the fire personnel coming together and working as an organized team. He was just like, it is a different world. Like We have it so good in the hospital <laughs> with the AC and the personnel and the crash cars and all that stuff. Yeah. Too. It was a cool experience. The, the thing that's been interesting for me is that as I put students out to do their ride-alongs, um, they come back sometimes vocationally changed. Uh, I've had more than five students in the four years that we've been doing this program come in and tell me that they want to quit medical school. Really? And become firefighters. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. So um, it's it's pretty they're, – when they do this, they're in their third year. Mm -hmm. Um, or their residents. So it's pretty easy to tell them, nah, cool your jets. Um, But I do have, um, I do have a student who's a second year resident in um, Ventura County, who's now tagged into a volunteer fire department up there. Oh, really? So when he's not in the emergency room, he's riding out and uh, performing as a paramedic. Yeah. And he knows what his scope is Yeah, and he's perfectly comfortable there. So that's kind of cool. And then I've had, um, I had one gal who, uh, announced to her father um, that she wanted to become a firefighter when she was 10. And uh, her father f- said that the girls don't become firefighters. <laughs> You're going to become a, a physician. You'll be a, a, a medical doctor. So that was her whole focus as she was growing up and, and going through high school and, and uh, her bachelor degree. And then she got in the medical school. And uh, she rode out with um, County. And they get a chance to ride out in the uh, fall semester and the spring semester of their third year. Um, she rode out with County um, at the same station both times. And um, at the second, the second time she rode out, they suited her up and they had her out back throwing ladders. And uh, they had her nice. reloading hose and rolling hose. And she came in and after that experience, she, she said, you know what, Mr. Miller? I could have been a firefighter if I wanted to. Oh. I said, that's right. That's right. You know. And then did she say, my name is Carrie? <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, you know, beautiful women can do hard things, man. Far be it for me to limit that. I, in fact, I was one of the biggest opponents to bringing women into the, uh, the Los Angeles City Fire Department. Even though my wife was a, a cop, cops had that equalizer. You know, if, if somebody gets in your face, you could just shoot them. Uh, <laughs> but for that um, solves that. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So for uh, the fire side, you know, I didn't believe that uh, a woman could drag me out of a house. You know, if I had collapsed, if I had an issue, to, to just to prove their point, they they put me as one of the people in charge of the pre academy for the first class of women recruits, and uh, I have never been so impressed with the, these five women. I'll never forget them. And one of them I followed all the way through her career with LA City. She retired as an assistant chief, which was a big nice. deal. Oh, yeah. And uh, she ended up being at the same station I was at. And I had no issue about her being able to drag me out of a building. I was watching her do reps and bench pressing uh, 280 <laughs> pounds. You know, and I'm Jesus. thinking, I, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, so like, I, I get asked that question all the time. 
I'm like, oh, do you really think a woman should be in the fire service? Yeah. You know, could they drag you out of the burning building? And I, I went through academy, and you know, just like any any man, there are some men who can do it, and there's some men who can't. Mm-hmm. And there were some badasses in my fire academy. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. You know, there was this girl, uh, we always called her Mo, but Melissa, she was able to like, she was 5'2", maybe 140 pounds, but she was able to pick me up, throw me over her shoulder like it was nothing. She could throw yeah. a ladder like the rest of them. You know, like I would, ha- I would have her on my crew than like half the guys in my academy. Yeah. And it's, it's just the individual, right? You have to look at that individual it basis. It is. It is. And it, it also comes back to it. It's not, it's not the, the size of the dog in the fight. Wait, it's not the, it's the, yeah, it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. Oh yeah. And um, there are different ways to do things. I mean, I, I was always uh, Mr. Macho. I was one truck company after another because I thought, well, that's that's where the guys with testosterone. Are. <laughs> <laughs> Knuckle dragger. Oh yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And, and you know, I, I was trying to get as far I away. Plenty from, of steroids from those guys. <laughs> I was trying to get away from as, as much uh, pre-hospital medicine as I could, and and I finally had a battalion chief tell me, hey man. Being a paramedic's like stepping in dog shit with when you're wearing your vibrant soles. You can scrub all you want. It's not you're not getting it off. It's, <laughs> it's always going to be there. That sense always going to be there. And sure, you know, I'm very fortunate um, that luckily it was always there for me. Uh, I had a good time doing truck stuff. It was sweaty, hard work. And well, I'd like to compliment these two gentlemen here with Ryan and Josiah because these guys, I mean, studs. They they carried me on every call. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they they would, like, comp- they would it's compliment. Nighttime. I'm tired. I'm just gonna <laughs> pop on my back and give piggyback rides. Then, hey, uh, what do we do on Josiah? What do we do? And that's just saying hypothetically. What happened if I was gonna ask you? What do we do on this? Just don't just go and show me. Just go and show me. <laughs> I mean, you said I can. I make great left turns and right turns when I'm driving the ambulance. So what? Uh, what? Uh, what do you think about uh, if I just kind of asked you a question like this? What would you, what would you do? <laughs> hypothetically, but, and I think we should change kind of change our thinking about everything and our perspective because you you ask yourself uh, uh females in the fire service can they carry me out of building it should be can she push me back into the building when it's on fire for me at yeah. least you yeah. know so be that you know, motivator that yeah because i know, bite yeah i mean if <laughs> yeah. i want to get out of a building do you know on those calls like you know, this is kind of hairy i could get out of here so i had to jump when i blew my there. back out the first person i went to was uh, uh, a woman that i knew and i said hey how are you doing this because I know they're doing it. You know, how are, how are, when you're aloft, what are you, um, how are you cutting your holes? How are you doing that? How are you throwing your axe? And I learned a lot from her because I needed to take that stress off my lower back. And, uh, man, it was all about how you move your body. It was, I mean, it was all that kind of stuff. A lot more the technique rather than it was all. the brute force. It's kind of like a, I always hear like jujitsu guys who are small have to learn the precise right, right, technique right. because they can't use their, their muscles or their weight to throw the other guy around. Yeah, around. Yeah, Unlike, yeah. You know, I have the luxury of being a big guy. I can just put my body weight into something and pull the hose and do drags, and my life's easier. I don't have to worry about that technique. Well, you know, if, if you I exercise, wanna... you can lose that waist. <laughs> Longevity-wise, yeah. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. If you lose it, I'll come try and find it for you, okay? But, <laughs> but that technique is what prevents that injury, you know? Yeah. So that's uh, it's one of those important things that you need to refocus, especially if you're a bigger guy like us. Yeah. That, uh, you've been using having bad technique or bad, bad habits your whole career, you know, get rid of them you need to learn that good technique yeah 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 i used to i used to preach that uh, and teaching intubation that if you're looking at your arm and, and your knuckles are turning white and your hands shaking like that when you're trying to intubate somebody you're doing it wrong oh yeah if you're seeing that then you're not doing it the correct way it's it's um it's style not strength and uh finesse not force and i'd preach that all the way across that uh if you're doing it the wrong way even cutting a car apart i mean if you're fighting the tool you're not doing it right yeah it's a game of inches you're not grabbing the spreaders and slamming it into the car and yeah, scaring your yeah. patient and doing all these things. It's, it's a nice, gentle movement. You're just, it's a game of inches. You spread a little bit, push a little bit, spread a bit. So That's what so she yeah. said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's a family show. Crap. Is it? Uh, yeah, oh, we're drinking. I don't think it's too family. Hold on a second. I think I'm in the wrong apartment. <laughs> so, Mr. Miller, uh, I'd like to rewind it a little bit. I know you've touched on different parts of uh, your career up to this point, but what was the starting point, the catalyst that got you to where you are today was it in the air force or if you so, want to give a little um, background about yourself uh it, it's i don't really know how i ended up in the air force uh the story that i used to tell myself was that i was going to be drafted uh, so i enlisted and <laughs> and now you can throw in your you can't gate. make me i'm going uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly right if i'm going to be a ground pounder i'm joining the air force do you do that online or do you <laughs> <laughs> so um I, I ran my date, and there's no way I would have been drafted. My number was so high, so I, 
I can only figure that that I remember at one point my parents, God rest their souls, um, when I was a, a junior in high school, they told me that um, I wasn't as smart as my sister, who was uh, 12 years my senior, and I wasn't as gifted as my brother, who was 10 years my senior, and that um, they weren't going to pay for my college like they'd paid for theirs. And um, I was going to, um, I should either get a, a job as a, uh, some kind of vocation, like maybe a copy or repairman. Um, and by the way, uh, you'll be moving out the September after you graduate. <laughs> Yeah, so there you go. And uh, I went, actually went down to join the Marine Corps, and the Marine Corps recruiter was out to lunch. And the Air Force guy goes, oh, come on, you, over, you can wait over here. <laughs> they, they, they do that, don't they? <laughs> they do. They do. And the fire thing, I can only guess that uh, at one point my, my dad had belonged to um, uh, the Elks Club, and he'd taken me to uh, Fire Station 33 with LA City Fire because he had a friend who worked there. And I think I was like 12 years old at the time. And they got a call, and uh, we were there for lunch. And so they all dash out to the equipment, and uh, they're, they're pulling the apparatus out. And I'm watching the, the truck go by. I'd never really seen a fire truck before. And it just keeps going by. I mean, the thing never ends. And then it finally <laughs> gets to the bucket at the back, and there's this guy up there with this gigantic steering wheel, and he had these mirrored sunglasses. I'll never forget this. that were red, white, and blue. And he's wearing this black helmet. And he looks down at me and he gives me just a wave. And I went, oh, shit. Yeah, that's me. America. <laughs> that's yeah. America. <laughs> yeah, hello. I'm all about Team America. And uh, so that must have sunk in at some level. Because when I went into the Air Force, you know, they, they give you these aptitude tests. And they wanted to make me a, a missile, missile technician because I scored so well. And I said, no, I want to be a firefighter. And the guy's trying to talk me out of it because the firefighting and security police and all the, the cooking and truck drivers, that's the, where they throw all these guys that score poorly on these exams. And I'd scored really well. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, why would I want an idiot to be a firefighter? It doesn't, yeah, right? yeah. At the time, a fireman. Uh, <laughs> so it didn't make any sense to me. So that's, that's how I got into it. And uh, that was 1971. And then uh, watching Johnny and Roy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what solidified the thing about becoming a, a oh, paramedic yeah. was that, oh, oh, yeah, when he's popping open those. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah, the, I still the, do that. Yeah, yeah, the sodium. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. If you're going to do it, I teach people how to do that. I say, hey, wait, 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 wait. You have to do it like this. So I've got third year residents who've never seen that because they have. Yeah. And I say, yeah, just get your, you can, even with your exam gloves on, you still get your nail in there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah you it's wanna, more I've seen nursing students, they just, I don't know how they screw the pooch, but I was like, no, you never watch like, you have to watch Grey's Anatomy or something, but they wouldn't know how to do it, and then they wouldn't get a good seat in it, and they yeah, tried yeah, to yeah. they try to push through the the preload, and then yeah, the whole cylinder would yeah, yeah yeah yeah. I was like, uh, <laughs> hey, look at these are expired. It's, right? more <laughs> <laughs> it's more impressive of a pop when it's a screw top. You should ask me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But how you train them is the one, two, three, four. I declare a thumb war, and you really get <laughs> what, you get it in there. <laughs> so you spin them off. Yeah, and just kind of. But you have to ask. Do you have any history of uh, family arthritis? No, <laughs> just, hmm. Got some pretty uh, bulky knuckles there. Yeah. So that's how that's how I got into the fire service was through the Air Force, and uh, it's interesting because my wife was just telling me that she's never she's trying to think back and she doesn't think she's ever had a mentor, and um, maybe four or five years ago I wrote down. Every mentor I'd ever had, you know, starting with my drill instructor in the Air Force who did all kinds of extra stuff for me that I didn't deserve, but he just went through hell and high water to see that I got certain things through that, that experience I was in from 71 to 74 and um, had two tours of duty in Southeast Asia and just, man, had a great time. Came out thinking that this is, actually came out thinking I wanted to become a physician and because uh, I'd done some uh, work with a missionary in Thailand when I was stationed there. And uh, it only took really one semester for me to figure out that I don't have the horsepower for this. You know, that to sit there and listen to somebody talk and figure out what's going to be important and what's not important, um, that wasn't working for me. So I kind of bailed on it. And then in L.A. City in 79, I became a paramedic. And that's where that started. It was pretty fun. Nice. All right, I have to ask, what's your P number? Oh, yeah. Um, gosh, sure, ask me. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious because it has to be like, it's well, probably... You know, it's, it's probably probably late there. 70s. It's pretty you know, I was just at LA County EMS because I'm going to retake my accreditation for uh -huh. for the county. So I'm already at 10,000. I'm at I'm 10744 for LA County. They issue uh, you your own P number. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. 4016. <laughs> wow. 
Wow. <laughs> there you go. Well, my before they had these numbers, my LA County number was uh, one of the last three digit numbers. I was uh, 998. Dang. There you go. Well, yeah, I thought I I'm was in all the thirty thousands. I thought I was all of that. And I went to a, a CE at, in Valencia at Henry Mayo Hospital. Okay. There was a guy in there whose county number was eight. Eight. <laughs> oh, jeez. And I went out. Oh, <laughs> all right, man, you win. So he's in the well, single digit. Yeah. If I if I can get in, okay. So I keep on hearing. Well, learning to keep on hearing from you fun, and then you have this old timey doctor's bag. You still haven't committed to buying any laudanum from me. <laughs> But can you run me through uh, like you know, a jungle cook? Like what it entailed? Or yeah, like... yeah. I'm, so I, you... I kept on thinking like fatigues, camouflage. No, so it was no, just huh. it was just like a a hodgepodge of different things that prevented you from just working at, at your full potential. It's right? not an assistoly. So <laughs> it may have been, but it's not anymore. So the whole point, and there actually is a point besides you know fucking with them. Um, <laughs> the whole point is that. Your patient, and I get this, I, I do the same thing with the, the third year residents. It's a dynamic patient. And when you're getting your labs back, you're getting your labs back from that patient 20 minutes ago. And now you're hoping to figure out trending, but you don't have time to figure out trending because now your patient's changed. Mm-hmm. So now you're looking at these x-rays that you got 30 minutes ago. That's 30 minutes ago. Where's your patient now? So you're trying to figure out trending. Oh, your patient's changed again. So what are you going to do? Look at all of that or look at your patient because it's, it's no different than what I taught you guys. You don't treat the monitor. You treat your patient. Right? Yeah. With physicians, they have more distractions. All exactly. The, like, it's exactly what it is. And all these exactly other things. what it is. So this is an opportunity for, as a physician, that you take one of your trusted second years, let them look at that junk. You run this code. You stand at the foot of the bed and you be the leader. And uh, if you've got questions, if you're wondering where the code's going, here's your team. You know, value your team and get their perspective, get their input, um, share with them what you're thinking and get back from them what they think as a team, which has been an interesting because um, there are so many people that this is alien to uh, specific nurse. Uh, she'd been a, a nurse in the ED for like 40 years and nobody had ever asked her that she'd run mm. code after code or gotten out of the way as soon as that first year resident come up and watch them screw their pooch as he's he's running the code. And to all of a sudden have people ask her what, I still remember that when I was running, so I worked at Cedar sinai for um, a mm-hmm. little over a year and I did code team training. And I still remember that woman crying, that it, thinking that it's taken 40 years for somebody to value her, her, not only her vocation, but her experience and to, to ask her for that input. Yeah, because it's huge. It's huge. What they did at, at Cedars was uh, take your ACLS card and that's just your entry card into being part of the response team uh, for doing codes or doing rapid response. And uh, then you do a, another two days of training after you've got that card. Just because you have that card doesn't mean that you're ready to do the do. Oh, yeah. And in doing the training, it was just one simulation after another simulation after another simulation that we capped off with a jungle code. Oh, nice. And jung- oh. jungle code didn't have to be crazy like I was talking about where people are wearing masks and ear protectors and all of that kind of stuff. A jungle code can just be noise where the, the ambient noise is so loud that you have to learn how to listen. So don't listen to the James Bond movie. Listen selectively <laughs> to your teammates. Yeah, and, so it, nice. it wouldn't be like, a, well, we're, we're used to it in the field, but I've been in the hospital before where families screaming, making it just difficult to hear exactly. one another exactly. and orders and all that stuff. But I know there's a lot of hospitals that are moving toward like nurse-run lead codes right. in the sense that they're the ones covering the ACLS stuff. They're the ones who are keeping time, and they're doing all the the typical medications that we're used to. Mm-hmm. And the physician's taking a step back, looking at everything, and then he's focusing on the patient-specific uh, disease processes and other potentials that they might need to give or um, medications or care that might be pertinent for that particular right. patient right. while all the other stuff, the CPR and the BVM. Did you get that on MCRIT? I, did I was about to bring that up too. Yeah, so yeah. I think it's a, it's a really good technique because it, it allows almost like two leaders, one sp- focusing on the specifics, the others focusing on the basics. You know, and I think there's a good plenty yeah. of nurses who have a, a wealth of experience that would be more than capable of doing that. Right, right. You know, in England, the system, and in Australia, the system is, is completely different for paramedics because they don't have PAs and they don't have nurse oh. practitioners. Oh. They have paramedics. 
So um, you have a basic level paramedic, and then you have a paramedic who rides on an ambulance, and then they have a little bit more knowledge, a little bit more stuff they can do. Then you've got a paramedic that flies. they got a little bit more knowledge, a little bit more they can do. And then you've got paramedics that do private practice. They can write script. They can uh, the whole oh, wow. nine yards. And uh, it, it's a pretty interesting system. It's too bad that, that we never went that way, but what we have kind of works. Uh, it just depends on, on how we want to grow it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I know. I just feel like there's so much potential. I don't know what's what's limiting it, but yeah, as far as like the paramedicine aspect. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it really helped me through my first year as a nurse. Like just just the skill set, yeah. really, so that I could focus on charting and thinking like a nurse. But just dropping lines, IMs, giving the fluid boluses, that really yeah. helped me a lot in my first year. The stress. Yeah, that took a lot of stress off because I, you know, once you get a patient, you have four lines, lab, urine, drawing blood, and like if you botch that IV, which and now I know in nursing school, you don't have that exposure. Everything's on med surge or you're in OB. Like ER is almost an elective and that's where you do most of your skills. And Ooh. so like now you're trying to be a nurse and if you don't have any prior medical background, you're also trying to do your master your skills and then manage for patients and then chart. And then charting is different than EMS, you know. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential. If I definitely if saw that with the, my, my limited teaching experience. I taught ACLS and Palace for five years uh, for a private company. And I'd see that with a lot of the like PA students or nursing students that have any kind of medical background, you know, it's, it's so beneficial to have somebody who has EMT or paramedic experience prior mm -hmm. to those higher level of um, educations, just because they have that foundation of the skills and the stress and the patient assessment to kind of better utilize that elaborate knowledge base that they're acquiring and actually put it to a good use compared to somebody who's trying to learn everything all at once and they're focusing right. on these little skills that become stressful just when you have to perform them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a growing number of medical schools on the East Coast that your first month of medical school is becoming an EMT. And then oh. alongside that, when you finish that, your first year of patient interaction is working with the local volunteer ambulance companies. Oh, wow, nice. And that's how it grows. So um, it's been anecdotal for me as I've watched students that, that come in and uh, the ones that are EMTs and paramedics, I naturally get attracted to me. So I've actually put together a program now that grows uh, pre-med students out, the ones that are out getting their bachelor's degree, it grows them across four years. Their first year, they, they learn uh, real CPR, not the, the pretend stuff. <laughs> and then over the summer, they become CPR instructors. And the next year, they're teaching CPR. And it's healthcare provider CPR. And then the next summer, they're becoming EMTs. And then the next summer, they're becoming um, disaster medical services trained. Hmm. Oh, no, no. They're, they're cert. They become cert trained. Oh, okay. City so, yeah, is yeah. cert training them. So now in the fourth year, I end up with, with um, about 180 students who will be EMTs who are cert trained um, and have been exposed to disaster medical management. So if we have an on-campus disaster, they know how to function. And that's been through the coordination with the School of Medicine, obviously the campus, but Environmental Health and Safety and UCRPD. So uh, it's become a really valuable program. And like you're saying, the, the big thing about becoming an EMT and then going to medical school is you've already spoken to strangers. You've already done medical assessment, and that's huge. And we see them do so much better in clinical skills when they're learning how to do uh, patient assessments, and then we grow it from there. That's one of the biggest things I tell my EM students that come do ride-alongs. I'm like, get used to talking to strangers. In the back of the ambulance, make small talk, learn how to communicate. Uh, if you need practice, whenever you're checking out a grocery store, any interaction that you can have, let's just be friendly, learn how to communicate with somebody who you don't know, and that will get you above and beyond, leaps and bounds ahead of, of, of the, the right. every other right. person, you know? Yeah. And just, just have a conversation. You're, you're a detective, but just a person okay so your response should be hey, it's really raining out there right and most humans say well, yeah but we need it, huh <laughs> I, I can't tell me times i've had like little conversations with people in the back of the ambulance where it had nothing to do with you know patient assessment questions but we're yeah, sitting there talking yeah. and all of a sudden something comes up i'm like wait what'd you just say yeah oh that's definitely what's going on with you like i remember this lady we're just talking about working night shift and all the caffeine i drink <laughs> and she was having renal problems and she was young she was like early 30s and they didn't know why and couldn't figure it out i was talking about drinking energy drinks she's like oh yeah me too i drink about five to ten monsters a 
day. I'm like, uh, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> ching, ching. Yeah. And she was like, yeah, yeah, about, you know, usually 10, but sometimes if I'm not feeling it at five, wow. like, do you're drinking wow. water. She's like, not usually. I'm like, well, wait, when well, you're not you feeling it, like you can't lift your arm to drink it. <laughs> yeah. or, I need an energy drink to drink wow. this energy drink. And That's they're like, crazy. oh, and she was telling me how she just, the doctor couldn't figure out what was going on. It was, and so, so this Dang. little thing that could pop up in conversation, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. We've had uh, several of those calls where, I mean, the, we have the, the whole joke between me and Josiah where it's, my Spanish isn't that great, but we say, hola, and they're like, <laughs> give, give you a look. <laughs> How? What? But uh, an experience this uh, last night with when, you know, you're trying to talk to, well, communicate with somebody, like, stomach, does, does, does it hurt? Like, do you want to vomit? And they're like, but if you did one of these. <laughs> <laughs> they would understand. Like, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, like you, you, you point at them and go, I'm going to slit your throat. And then nice. your head, they, any language, oh, oh how dare you? Well, but if you did, oh, stomach not so, so good, just, uh, and they're like, yeah, what? you pantomime what? vomiting, and they're like, I don't understand what you're saying. Like, okay, well, this communication. But that, obviously, you didn't go to the French school of my marine. <laughs> <laughs> how dare thee? So, and I think that's that you say, hey, uh, how much did you, how much does gas cost, right? Uh, it's ridiculously high. It's 369. And you go, uh, how much is your prescription? Uh, what prescription? <laughs> And you're like, you have like 20 of them. Just pick one. I don't have no, any idea what you're talking about. Like, I haven't bought any of my meds in years. Yeah, right? I just, they, they, I've they, been they, neglecting them. They, 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 like, I, oh. I have plenty of these scripts, and they sit there. They don't do anything for me. It's, I don't know how they could. They're 2D. I mean, I look at them, but I don't feel any better. <laughs> one of the cases that we run with the IPE group, with that 350-person group, is uh, shoebox medicine. We've, we made 35 shoeboxes, and each shoebox has 15 to 20 medications in it. And the school of pharmacy made all the labels, so it looks really, really good. Except that, that we're short on uh, good and plenty because they eat them all. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no neko evers. <laughs> oh. Yeah, right. So they have to they have to go through the box, and they have to they have to figure out what their history is based on the medications. Well, not all those medications in the box belong to the patient. Not all the medications in the box are current. So now they have to figure out well, what's current, what's not, what's the patients, what's not the patients. Are they are maybe they're taking somebody else's medication? So what's that going to do? And for this one case, um, it's actually it's called the amazing case of Mrs. Wu. It's a real it's a real case uh, about an uh, an 89 year old Chinese woman who got lost in the medical system oh, in Kaiser, huh. San Francisco. How do you get lost in Kaiser? And it was a real story. And in the end, after a year, uh, she was tired and depressed. Her husband had died three years ago, something like that. Um, and she ended up seeing just this ridiculous number of physicians and nurses and social workers, and she was hospitalized for six weeks and this and that, and you're just going, holy crap. And if you didn't go through the meds right, you wouldn't get the story because that's where the story was, that she Mm. had given up on American medicine and had gone back to traditional medicine. I was now taking a tea that one of the local Asian pharmacists Mm -hmm. had mixed for her, and it mixed with oh, one yeah. of the medications and so it, it, it gave her hypotension so oh, at any point somebody could, i've never heard of this medication dr shoals nine wide <laughs> what yeah, i'm yeah, just prescribing yeah. this what are you snorting that powder <laughs> but that's like every call for us in the yeah. us is like we're walking to somebody's house oh yeah and yeah. there's just a counter full of meds and you're like okay well yeah this unresponsive patient isn't able to talk to us exactly. so let's try to figure exactly. out what's going on that that literally happened to me my last shift where i don't this, believe you <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> I didn't believe you. Pixar did well, happen. Along with huffing uh, air duster, this guy, they're like, do you have any, does he have any prescriptions? And she's like, no. Has he taken any medications of his medications? No. Has he taken anybody's medications? Yeah, yeah. He took a bunch of Oxycontin. You're like, okay. So we ended up having to push a bunch of Narcan. He, yeah, like, he was completely but unconscious. Uh, yeah. You're like, yeah. Did, did the... Asking that right question. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Well, well, have you ever taken somebody to the hospital where you've asked them all the right questions? And you got all these answers from him. And then when you get him to the hospital, the nurse goes, and what's going on? And he goes, I got this crushing chest pain. They never told you that. Oh, every oh, week. Not, oh, yeah. My, yeah, my, yeah. I have as soon as the they time. get to the nurse, the story changes. So. I have the great instinct because my shoulder like just asshole. starts to dip. My back hurts. <laughs> just, yep. Like that just happened on Monday. So I was stuck in triage all day, 12 hours. Post-holiday, right? So I didn't have any downtime. There's just a line out the, <laughs> a line out the door, like in and out. 
And so this one guy comes in, he's like, oh man, I have vertigo. I've the room spinning and I have a headache and you know, like there's a little ringing in my ears and I prescribed meclizine and it, it kind of works, but it kind of doesn't. And I was like, okay, so you just hear, you, th- you think your uh, vertigo is flaring up. Yeah, I think so. And then same stuff, shortness of breath, chest pain, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, that, that's it. Oh, okay, cool. Send him through the RME process, which is like our, our fast track. So uh-huh. the mid-level will see him, P-A-N-P. And I, I knew who was on and standard, he'd get a CT. He had a huge bleed. Whoa. He had a baseball sized bleed with a midline shift and he had to nice. go to ICU. But, you know, and then everyone's giving me crap. I'm like, did you not do your stroke symptoms? <laughs> no, this guy walked in and was just like, oh, I'm yeah, a little right, dizzy. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You yeah. know? And, um, yeah, and even, you know, the PA was like, yeah, he, he went to work today and all this other stuff that was happening for three days. But, I mean, I saw the CT. It was like a huge baseball sized bleed. And yeah. I was like, what, what, the guy came in, he was doing the robot. Like, <laughs> just, there was, there was, but just that, you know, <laughs> it's fluid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you say one thing and then someone else will talk to him and then he'll tack on some stuff. Oh, that's, and I was like, that oh. happens to us all the time. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure just it's happened like, like, you just throw your hands up in the air. I'm like, sorry, nurse yeah, or doc. Yeah. You're like, this is the story I got. And they're like, okay, paramedic. I'm um, sure yeah, you, exactly. Oh, right. I hate that. that. I hate it. Oh. I'm sure it's happened at least once in my career. It's like, <laughs> you want to write out. You want to see what I do all day. You want to write out with me. So, 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 so. I promise I'm good. <laughs> Here's the real story. That guy, Mike, no, on his name tag, it says Michael. But I didn't want to tell him this <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, why not well why not i mean crazy. I, I think it's my breath crazy. but yeah. all right so i'm gonna shift gears a little bit there's oh, i geez. was doing doing some research just kind of looking at the, the state of the healthcare education right now i was curious to get your input on what you think the future of medical school and medical education it looks like and uh you know how we go about getting there well the way that medical school works now uh, which was news to me because i knew nothing when i got the i got recruited into this and um, I got recruited because in 2011, my teaching uh, colleague and I were at Clark, uh, Tom Booth. And I just saw um, him last week. Did you? Uh, I'm I'm uh, getting certified to teach PhD less. Oh, that'll do it. And yeah. he was there yeah. to uh, assess me whether I was adequate or not. I was like, hey, Mr. <laughs> Booth, that's me, He was like, I know who you are. I was like, I just wouldn't imagine that you'd remember me, but it's good to see you again. <laughs> yeah. I know you, Mr. Cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to evaluate you. I'm going to be behind you the whole time. Like his 500-pound gorilla. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's in the back look, looking at us. Funny. Like, <laughs> you're good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, right. So um, we had a salesperson, sales rep from Lerdall. It was, oh, I probably shouldn't say that they're from Lerdall. But I said it anyhow. Anyhow, um, this sales rep uh, said that uh, UC Riverside, they just bought four mannequins and they're just having all kinds of connectivity problems. And I, I don't have the time for them. I've got to go to Los Angeles and make a sale. So she dashes out. And Tom and I look at each other and we go, well, that's not right. And you know, we'd been holding these these uh, our mannequins together with, um, with bailing wire and racing tape and and getting stuff at Radio Shack and getting stuff at Ace Hardware to keep them running. So we pack up all of our junk and uh, we grab Tom's truck, which is a Cal Fire truck, and we drive over to UC Riverside. Mm-hmm. And the, the people at the information booth don't even know that there's a school of medicine there. So they get a map out. It's new. It's really new. Yeah, right? right? So they figure out where it is, and they send us over there. So we park in the red because red, fire truck, duh. And we go into the reception, and we ask for uh, the simulation center. And the the receptionist goes, there's a simulation center here? (laughs) So um, they figured that out. Your information, right? We go downstairs to the simulation center, and here's these four immaculate rooms with these beautiful mannequins. I mean, the stuff that we had was so abused and so nasty. Nasty. And by the time you guys saw it, it was 10 years old. And they still have the same stuff there. I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, and these things are beautiful, just mm-hmm. beautiful. And they're having trouble getting one to come on. So we're looking at it. And we figured out that the problem was just in the sequencing, that they weren't giving it enough time for this to come up and then turning on this and turning on that. But then we start looking at the other mannequins and Tom's in another room and he goes, Chris, Chris, come and look at this. So I go in the other room and Tom has pulled the sheet back. Well, the, the legs on this mannequin aren't even attacked. <laughs> the mannequin is under the sheet and it looks like it's being used, but there's no equipment in any of the rooms. And we found out that what they were doing was just bringing people through and showing it to them. The students weren't coming in there for anything. So when they hired me uh-huh. two years later, the same mannequins still didn't have the legs attached. <laughs> And uh, the Just mannequin, point. That yeah. we, yeah. right? We the have mannequin the that, that, yeah. um, that they were having, they were using for show and tell, um, had like 18 hours on it. So oh, in wow. two years, they'd used it. They turned it on and turned it off for when they take a tour through. 
Yeah. And Whoa, that, it blinks its eyes. I want to go <laughs> there. Yeah. yeah. And that, that was it. So um, I wasn't sure I wanted to be there, but I found out that uh, medical school is divided into two years. So the first two years are called the preclinical years, and it's all didactic learning. And then the second two years are the clinical years, and it's all rounding. So the first of those two years, um, they're interns at local, not interns. Chumps. <laughs> uh, monkeys uh the first the first two year the first year no, the, thir the third year their first year of clinical they're rounding in local hospitals okay hospitals where they have affiliation agreements and then the fourth year which is the second year of clinical they can go almost anywhere in the world they want to go there's certain things they have to do they have to do emergency medicine internal medicine uh, they have to do radiology uh, they have to do surgery they have to do peds and they have to do a guy and then they've got three more things that they can do wherever that whatever they want to do and then they got a month vacation that they can they have to take so um when i started in 2013 the thing about uc riverside is that it had existed as a medical school since 1977 but they only taught the first two years the pre-clinical years and then for the last two years they shipped them off to ucla and ucla would graduate them and give them those last two years and then they oh, wow. graduated from ucla they didn't say anything on any of their paperwork about being at um at riverside so in 2013 it was the first class that had started that would be with them for all four years and um i still remember one of the one of the people there i was asking a lot of questions about how they did things because a lot of things didn't make sense to me i mean i'm 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 but a simple and lonely firefighter <laughs> And they have this. They had this great uh, teaching medium that they used. That was called problem-based learning. And in problem-based learning, the 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 class is divided up into small groups of eight people. And uh, those eight people sit in like a conference room. They call it a PBL room. And they have a slowly revealing case. So they find out this little bit of information first, and then they always ask the same five questions after they find that out. Um, once that's revealed to them, they 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 have to ask, what else would you like to know? Um, what do you think it is? What test would you run? What research would you look for? And what research could you write based on what you see? And for the first year, they have to do that every week, two days a week. And uh, it's a, a two hour deal. So they do this PBL thing over and over and over again. And I asked this just a simple question of the guy that ran the PBL. So I just said, hey, I'm just curious, what are the learning objectives? And the guy just gave me the absolute stink eye. I mean, he just <laughs> looked at me. The I'm, rancid eye. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was. There you go. Yeah, it was a zombie eye. Um, this is this was in a, in a meeting, and it was obvious that he wasn't going to talk to me because I am just a paramedic. And he didn't even acknowledge that I asked a question. He just continued to talk. And the gorilla in the room says to him, he says, uh, hey, you know what, uh, Doc? I think it's a valid question. What are the learning objectives? So he starts to fumble through something. He's shuffling, he's shuffling his paper, and he's looking right at me. And he makes up something, and I said, man, those are the learning objectives? Those don't sound like learning objectives. I mean, I, I'm just the firefighter paramedic. I don't know. That, that's it? And um, when I walked out of that room, the first thing I thought of was, this place sucks. How can, <laughs> they, how can they make physicians when they don't know what they're doing? I mean, when they – and I started pushing all these – things back and say, well, what are the teaching outcome? What are you looking to accomplish in this class? Well, they didn't have any of that. It was all implied. I mean, it makes sense, I guess, because it was <laughs> what I found out was that doctorate level programs, that's how they work. Yeah. It's there, there is no structure lesson plan. So as I started to put my stuff together to teach, I started using lesson plans and I started sharing those with my boss who had never seen a lesson plan before. And he said, man, that makes perfect sense. How come we don't do that for everything? And I said, I don't, I don't know. I'm just a firefighter. And at many, many meetings, and to this day, I still say, hey, don't ask me, man. I'm, I'm the firefighter in the room. You know, big fire, big hose, little fire, little hose. You know, white stuff on the red stuff. It's been interesting to watch the change. You're asking about where's medical education going to go? It's going to go to a place that it doesn't want to go. Um, and there's a history of things not wanting to go places. Uh, and I'm pretty ingrained in that history. My side job, almost everybody in the fire department has a side job. My side job was working on airplanes. And I didn't just work on airplanes. I worked on engines. And I didn't just work on engines. I worked on engines that were pre-1918. And I had a little shop in Santa Paula. It was called Liberty Motors. And uh, because I saw a lot of Liberty engines. And uh, I, I didn't know how to fix an engine, but I knew how to take it apart. 
and I knew the people who knew how to fix the bits. Mm. And then I could put the bits back together and make it go. So um, I learned through this process that once upon a time, airplanes were made out of wood and paper. <laughs> True story. Yeah, right, right for those. And uh, yeah, and then they started using cloth. And when they introduced cloth, there was kind of an uproar about cloth because unlike paper, cloth shrinks. Hmm. So you're going to put extra tension on your wood structure. And then some idiot decided you could make an airplane out of metal. Well, it's not going to fly. It weighs too much. <laughs> How could you ever make an airplane out of metal? And there's, there were airplanes that were built during the Second World War, the beginning of the Second World War, where the whole airplane was metal except for the control surfaces because those are too important. So they were metal covered with fabric because, you know, you don't want to cover. You can't, <laughs> can't be all metal. People were kicked and dragged into moving from wood and fiber to metal. And the same thing happened moving from metal to composites, kicked and dragged. If you look at the fire service, back in the day, a long time ago, you think about horses. It wasn't horses. It was people. Peeps pulled the, you know, we still do it for games, you know, where you pull the hose, the hose cart. Um, people dragged all that stuff. And when they made the transition from people to horses, there was a, oh, oh, oh we can't do that. You can't trust a horse. You can't feed humans hay. <laughs> Hello. Derek, the only thing people hate more than the way things are is change. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. And then the, the change from horses to motorized equipment. <sighs> the change from cotton hose to, to a nylon. Synthetic, or, yeah. Oh, my gosh. The change from brass to something. Oh, my goodness. I was there for all of that. I watched all that happen. Um, the change from, I still remember in my drill tower with LA City, um, we had a bunch of old ape truckies come in and take a car apart with a come along and hacksaws faster than another group could do it with the, the Hearst Rescue Tool back in the day. Faster because they knew how to do it. You know, boom, 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 boom. They knew the steps. You know, the, the Hearst Tool, it took um, two men and four Boy Scouts to move the jaws around because they weighed so much. It took four people to get the power unit out of the truck. It was nuts. So change happens, but it doesn't happen willingly. People are kicked and dragged in the change unless you just accept it. I accepted it maybe 20 years ago um, when I realized that not so much with the fire service, which in retrospect, it was huge um, going from... Um, asbestos lined uh, canvas turnouts to uh, what we have today i still remember a battalion chief uh, fire station 39 with la city that said okay he's out he says i'm done i'm retiring you know they were forcing us to wear hoods and we had uh, we had those gauntlet uh, hands mm -hmm. and you're wearing gloves and you got hoods and you're pulling up your 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 collar oh. and you're throwing down the little thing well, you can't feel the heat anymore. If you can't feel the heat, you're just going to you know? kill you. How are you going to kill you? Yeah, because I, I, if I don't feel the heat on my ears, you know, if I can't put my hand, uh, but that's how they grew, you know, yeah, so absolutely. they didn't know any different. Sorry was the man who couldn't open a roof fast enough with an ax uh, because if you took the, the saw aloft, uh, they usually didn't start it because you're opening it up with, a, with, a, with an ax. But in, in uh, medical school, set up that way. And Riverside was one of the first schools to change that. So how it works in Riverside is that in the first month that students start, they're assigned to uh, a physician who's a primary care physician in the Riverside area. And they'll meet with that physician and be part of his practice every other week. So as they move through their first two years, even though the rest of the first two years is all classic whatever it was, they still have that one thing that was different by doing that. If you look at other schools, um, Hawaii is is probably the the oddest because every all their teaching, ninety eight percent of their teaching is done through problem based learning and uh, doing teachbacks. So it's it's going to change because it has to change because the the students we're getting are changing. Um, we do um, live cadaver. Or live, cadaver, live cadavers, <laughs> live cadavers, which are What's called zombies. Yeah, yeah. I need we to get do, into this. <laughs> we do gross anatomy with okay. um. We, I call them patient donors. I don't like call to them go on cadavers. dates too. <laughs> Ooh, do that again. Yeah, no, those little tweaks. Um, yeah, the lips. you cut glass with those. Um, <laughs> so we call them the cat burglar. <laughs> wow. Um, it's it's um, it's one of the the many things that I attacked was the way that um the cadaver-based gross anatomy was being run because I, I, I didn't 
I'd never seen a preserved body before. And the first time I walked into the gross anatomy lab, it's all wrong. The, the people just, I mean, besides the fact that they're dead, they're preserved. So the colors are wrong. Mm. The textures are wrong. Oh, the yeah. smells are wrong. It's, it, I, I really didn't get it. And it was the anatomist who taught me, well, they're only here for one reason, to learn anatomy. They don't learn any physiology with this. They learn anatomy. They learn all those jot and tittles of, of an arm and, and all of this stuff. So we had a student who wasn't doing well. And um, this is a, a, a Gen, Gen Xer. And uh, we experimented on him by using uh, a, a game that we found. The graphics had been done in Ireland. The game had been put together in Bulgaria. I think it was an Eastern European country. And it was run off Xbox. So if you knew how to use an Xbox controller, you could learn anatomy off of this thing in virtual reality. So this is almost four years ago now, and everything was big and clunky. And we put this stuff on this kid. We handed him that controller. He never had to look at it because that's what he knew. And he ended up acing gross anatomy because he had learned it through the game instead Mm -hmm. of learning it through a, a patient donor. Uh, so that's the changes that we see, that things are going to be coming at the student in different ways because we learn different ways. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's been the most exciting for me is that I, I get an opportunity to be on the cutting edge, not the bleeding edge. No pun I, intended. I, I <laughs> um, so it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool to watch it grow, watch it change. Uh, I think the first two years will always be what the first two years are. But the piece that I have for the first two years, um, they won't let me turn them into EMTs. So I put together a bunch of uh, extracurricular stuff. It's called Doctor in the House. And I basically took the EMT course and boiled it down to what's the important stuff. Because they literally weren't, they didn't learn how to control bleeding. It's not what they learned. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And they got CPR, but they didn't get anything above and beyond that. They couldn't deliver a baby. They didn't know what to do if they were on an airplane at 60,000 or 40,000 feet. Um, so we did have one of the classes that I I did with them, uh, Southwest Airlines was kind enough to, to loan me one of their uh, training kits oh. so they could see this is what your capabilities are, huh. you know, and this is what you can do and this is how it works. And uh, well, that led into uh, Good Sam stuff. Well, these kids never got anything on Good Samaritan laws on what their legal responsibilities are. That's crazy. Yeah, oh, that's like it, it was just EMT? Um, yeah. yeah. This yeah. call here, yeah. I'm just going to... Well, the, left or right? I don't know. If yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? And that, that was actually the guy that I used. I don't know if, if I used him with your class, but he's a, a paramedic who became a lawyer. And he does a really great uh, Good Sam class. No, I, he he chases he after his own ambulance, oh. huh? <laughs> yeah, I know right. we had some special guests come in. I, I remember the drug tampering guy, and mm-hmm. I want to say that he was one of them. The lo- mm, I remember Mercier. I remember the sheriff stuff for trauma and then the drug tampering, which yeah. was crazy. Like, yeah, yeah. I haven't received training like that since then. Yeah, yeah he still teaches really that good. stuff. I, he that's was a really picture cool. of a Can I add I before I forget? That. Like as far as run the mill paramedics, when they actually when they really get to see gross anatomy is when trauma when the person's turning inside out. Like, right, that doesn't right. look like anything in the book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Did you drop a bone? I don't so what I what I built into the the class because it ended up that uh, the chief anatomist and I we really hit it off. I mean he's just fun to work with, and I had all these ideas, and he said yeah 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 sure yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> when I brought in ultrasound, he's the guy that let me bring it in. We tied it into his hours for all the nice. kicking and screaming that we had from the the educational committees and all of that. It didn't matter. It was his time, and he was willing to give it up. So the students, while they were learning anatomy on these patient donors, were also learning anatomy on each other, the same sections to get, depending on what block they were in, by using ultrasound. So it turned out pretty Gucci. And um, I was <laughs> nice. pretty pleased with where it went. And I don't remember where I was going with that. No, Change well, the, or... just those little things like uh, I follow a pathologist on Instagram. And that's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Utilize. yeah. As a means of like, okay, actually getting to see real life injuries and stuff. Yeah, kind of yeah. Base my, yeah, Miss Angemi. Yeah, PA. that's the one I yeah, did. Yeah, she's yeah, great. Yeah, she, yeah, she's yeah, she great. posts some awesome pictures and, and, yeah. and then she follows it up with information about what occurred or what the injury was caused by. Or yeah, uh, I've got a paramedic who was in class 13, I think, and she just got sworn in last week as a deputy coroner. That was us. Oh, yeah, that, that was, was Mariella. Yeah, my, yeah. my teacher's, I want her, my teacher's I want her Dr. Michael Bodden. Yeah, yeah. Just, she was pretty excited. That's pretty cool. stoked. Do you guys ever watch the HBO Dr. Michael Bodden? I'm like, Oh yeah, no. this. yeah. I don't know. I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. Uh, he's a like a, a forensic uh, coroner, oh. really, really famous, and as far as for hire for uh, expert testimony. And he's like, it turns out the wife killed him, <laughs> <laughs> and this is how I know. <laughs> gave him some whatever. You know, a, a great uh, HBO uh, series, but I think they'll. It's been like at least twelve years since they've had a new one. But I'm like, oh, is this an, uh, on my phone? Is this a new one? No, it's not. 
<laughs> I was, I had a couple, well, you guys went to the, to the coroner's office, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah. remember one of our, so, our fellow students yeah. that was passed out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Really? So I, oh, yeah, he would turn stark white. And he was, like, I decided that was something I needed to do for the School of Medicine. That nice. they, they needed to, to see this. The, I, I mean, I really got, his, his name is Dr. Mo, um, Mo for Mohammed, but just call him Dr. Mo. I think we say Mofo. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, and uh, he was absolutely open to it when I said, well, you know, this is what I was thinking. He goes, yeah, 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 let's do that, let's do that. So now for their first year, uh, they're table groups. So there's like six students that have one patient donor, and we've got 12 patient donors. And uh, so maybe it's eight students. But they go down as a table group, and they get to go into the, the aquarium and be behind the glass, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and the, the pathologists teach to them, mm-hmm. and they really like it. I mean, it's really been refined. Um, so it came off so well that the third-year program, where they can ride out with, with fire, they can also spend those three days at the coroner's office. Oh, interesting. And right. this time they go behind the Iron Curtain, and uh, they get their hands on stuff, and they get the help, and they are taught um, huge things. I mean, neat stuff. And that went so well that we now have a fourth year um, opportunity for students to go down if they're interested in. I tell them if you're going for emergency medicine, you're going for surgery, you need to do this. You need to do this. Getting hands on a patient, be able to manipulate the the tissue and stuff like that. That's just invaluable. Ask any paramedic, hey, you want to see a cadaver that's ever been dissected? (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) How much are we talking here? (laughs) Uh, you paying me? And I'm just going you. through it and touching and, it? Yeah, and just, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I I was talking, yeah. It's so fascinating. When if I, I pay you a little AP more, classes. can I stand like two feet from it? Can look at it? <laughs> yeah. Because you're kind of like, that's what that looks like. Wow. And what's really been neat about the, the fourth year program is that uh, I have a, a couple of people now who've decided to go into to pathology as a result of doing that month down there. So that's cool. Nice. And then the, the pathologists have all, also also know that the people taking this, the ones that I'm pushing in that direction, are going into surgery or EM, so they'll ask them questions about, well, if this patient had lived, how would you, or could you do this, could you do that? Because they're, they're all physicians. They had to be before they went into pathology, which blew me away. And then I got why you'd want to be a pathologist, because those people start at 190000 a year, and they, they work... Wow. They work nine to five, four days a week. You know, for me, it's not about money. It's about just being gross and just kind of want to. <laughs> hey, uh, you want to put money? Is just to I thought you stick? said to not bring hey. up your necrophilia. <laughs> <laughs> I'd bring it down a little bit because I get too, way too excited. I mean, I got a special stick that I like to poke bodies with. Like, I mean, you ever heard the, the thing where, is, yeah, I knew he was dead because his shoe came off when the, after the car hit him. Like, one of those where you're like, you want to see a body? You got a body? <laughs> <laughs> Who are we talking here? No, nah, I just got a dead cat. I'll, I'll check that I'll out. Check dead that cat? Out. Yeah, I'll look at that. I got one too. <laughs> so I, I'm kind of curious, like, I, are all these, I don't want to get, like, negative, but I felt like, or I feel like, what I'm seeing with, like, the upcoming generation is that there's a little bit of a sense of apathy with certain students that I've come across. Are all these these different um, extracurricular activities and opportunities kind of mitigating that apathy that potentially would be there? Or are you seeing that? Like, I just noticed that when I was teaching ACLS and PALS, there would just be these blank stare. Like, I teach at nursing schools. and I'm sorry. There was just a complete, for some people, there was just... I, I, uh, I don't agree with it at all. So to accept the job at UCR, I had three conditions. Um, I worked there for a year half time because again I wasn't sure that I was ready to be a part of that culture and when I accepted the job I said okay I got three conditions the first condition is everything I do is going to be fun do you have an issue with that no all right next thing is nobody fails simulation nobody fails simulation I've had a big pushback on that yes. simulation is an opportunity to get more gooder oh yeah mm-hmm. and I've I mean I even had uh, the people who run the simulation center at Harvard Harvard at Harvard. <laughs> at Harvard, give me the pushback on that. And it's I said, well, wicked that's fine. Smart over there. You know, do what you want to do on the East Coast. It's wrong, but do what you want to do. Because, I, again, I have 100% par- extracurricular participation. They're all coming because they don't fail. They get an opportunity to do the do. And that's what they want to feel. They want to feel like physicians. And then the last piece was, piece was innovation. That you see something you want to try. You, you, you find a simulator you want to screw with. I'll call them and get. I'll borrow that thing. I got lots of connections. We've got stuff that we've gotten from Cedars, because Cedars has uh, they're well bankrolled, and uh, they'll replace last year's model with this year's model, and they'll take last year's model and put it into deep storage, 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 storage. Like Indiana, <laughs> Indiana <laughs> Jones, where the guy just pushed it, yeah, just they'll, pushed they'll it they'll back. Just, yeah, stuff disappears, and um, so I borrowed things from them and brought them out for them to look at, you know, because I don't have the ability to buy some of that stuff. 
but I've got the ability to borrow it so you can play with it. And if they read about something, they want to flow it out and try it. Let's do it. I'm all about uh, it. I usually don't have the ability to buy anything. I just really, really, really heavy on it, you know, <laughs> make it my own. <laughs> Like, like I did with this microphone. You know, that, yeah. that, <laughs> that 500 pound gorilla on the back of your neck. <laughs> All right. So we actually just knocked out an hour and 20 minutes. So, well, wow. Like, some like, editing like, for that. Kind of like, just flew by. Uh, like Mr. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Miller was saying. I mean, I feel like know. we only hit the tip of the iceberg, too. Yeah. When, so. when you're learning and it's fun, you're like, well, hold on. Get rid of this time thing. I just, I needed two hours. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm past that, right? I don't, <laughs> give me a little more. I mean, Give me a little more juice for my money. Like you said, we just hit the tip of iceberg, so I guess you're going to yeah. have to come back for our, oh, another episode. You have to. Um, come to a conference with us, and then we'll do a breakdown, too. Oh, oh yeah. I like that, yeah. yeah. We're, yeah. Uh, we're doing conferences a uh, couple this year, so we're going to try to do some episodes based off of what we learned from the conferences. So. Nice. And can, can I kick in one of the jokes that I just had to... Oh, he's, the been whole, he's been having in this whole story all night. So airplanes are made of cloth, right? And like, what... <laughs> Somebody goes, what kind of cloth? Is that hemp? And what are you, high? What? <laughs> hemp? Way too durable. I don't get it. <laughs> he wrote that down waiting to just I did that. <laughs> oh, I wrote that one. It's like, oh, 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 shit. Hemp joke. Actually, I got to get, um, get the hemp joke. Jo- 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 yeah, there's so many oh. things we didn't touch on. Like, have you ever left a gurney at a hospital? And how long did it take you for you to discover it? I've left a drug box. Uh, drug our box. dear friend Have Thomas you ever lost a drug box? Yeah, I left it at the nursing home. Yeah. And then another company found it So we didn't get in any of that stuff. Oh, I can't get fired Was that you or me that... Was that you and me that left the drug box out of nursing? No, because I did this before I went on night shift with you. Oh, I, I was did doing like that lunch too. every other Sunday. Yeah, and then we just swung that. That a movie every other Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's yeah, that's oh and gosh. like yeah. I ran I ran a code oh not a code but a call in Vegas where my they advanced the EMT left the gurney at the hospital and it was a chest pain open heart surgery like seven days ago with lady <laughs> oh and no we, we were first on scene and I opened the doors and, I know right and, and then I. <laughs> I tasted both my testicles in my mouth, like a little greater than when you get pulled over. That your just testicles are straight up, and I go, and then I go, come here to, to, to her. Here, here, we'll help you. We'll help you. And I grabbed the, grabbed the stair chair, got her on the stair chair, loaded nice. her up, and then fired a piece out. You guys, you guys got this right. Well, yep. Okay, man. Close the doors. You canceled. Yeah, did. Put him on the bench seat. Like uh, doing uh, things in the background, like uh, Home Alone with Macaulay Culkin. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> we got plenty of guys back here. Well, we don't need you. <laughs> go to the hospital, and then uh, one of my friends, uh, Mandy, she was at the hospital. And I go, Hey, you guys done with your call? Give me your gurney. Like, Give me the gurney. Oh put it in the back gosh. of the ambulance, load her up, and then walk in the hospital. And I think, no, no, we need a bed now. We need a bed now. Open our scars. Just because of righteousness, we found another cruise gurney at the hospital that they'd forgotten, and we were duty bound to take it to, back to their station for them. <gasps> oh, it just, this whole thing just reminded me. Yeah, it's not my tonsils. Let me just push push my testicles back down. <laughs> it's been at least ten years. Swallow we just kind of yeah. Uh, all right, do you want to do a sign off, Brian? Oh, wait, wait, Mike's never done the sign off. Uh, do you have chimes or something? Here, here, I'll do the. Uh... <laughs> Everybody have a great night. All right, thank you for listening to Holding the Wall. Like us at YouTube, Instagram, or iTunes. Feel free to contact us at holdingthewall at gmail dot com or DM us at Instagram at holding the wall. Thank you to our sponsors and support us on Patreon for extra content. Hope to see you soon. Toodaloo, motherfuckers.